Radio. Real stories, real life, real music. One of the most visible and best-selling rock bands of the 21st century, Daughtry have sold out concerts across the globe and Chris is joining us now on the back of a sellout tour of the UK. Chris Daughtry, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks, mate. Thank you for uh, agreeing to join us. Really excited to uh, to meet with you, to have this conversation. And these. You've had one hell of a career since the self-titled album Daughtry in 2007. Uh, and I note that it was the fastest selling rock debut album in SoundScan history and also nominated for four Grammy Awards and four American Music Awards, seven mu Billboard Music Awards, including Album of the Year. I mean, that's one hell of a way to start your career, isn't it? Yeah. And then it just went downhill from there. It was like... <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, that was, um, that was kind of a weird thing considering I was, um, very new to the industry and all of that stuff happened. I just assumed, oh, this is how it's always going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I and mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I don't know, I, I just touching on this, which is, 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 cause obviously you, you came through American Idol. That's where you sort of first shot to the, the prominence. And if you like, and, yeah. Um, it, it's certainly very true in this country that we we see a lot of artists that don't actually win, that maybe don't even make the final, that actually do better going forward in their careers than they do uh, yeah. the winners do, if you like. Do you think that's something that's is, is that something that's echoed in the states? And and do you have any theories as to why that might be? Because obviously you've enjoyed tremendous success. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's. There, I have a few theories, but I don't know how valid they are. But I, you know, I, for me, I never intended or never went into it with the intention or desire to win. Hell, I didn't even think I would make it through the first week because at that time there was no real, um, there was no like modern rock artists on the, on the show. And so I didn't think it would even get the attention from the general public that it did so my my short-sighted goal was to go on there and hopefully people go oh i know that guy and get more gigs you know what i mean like that was yeah. that was is that was my that was as far as i wanted to go and then it just kind of took off and and so for me i always had this this work ethic and this mindset to like i gotta i gotta do this for myself i got I, I wasn't expecting some trophy or some record deal handout or anything like that. So, um, and I think a lot of young people can get blinded by that going on a show like that and getting that notoriety and thinking it's all set, it's done. And, and all I have to do is show up when really you got to work your ass off in, in this industry, regardless of a TV show or, or getting discovered at a bar, you've got to work your ass off. And, and, and I think a lot of young people that go on the show can get kind of tricked into thinking that I'm on TV and the rest is history and yeah. it, everything's just going to fall in my lap. And I think they kind of fall prey to that, which I, you know, nothing, no fault of theirs. You know, I, I don't know how I would have reacted at 16, 17, going on a TV show like that. And 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 all of a sudden everyone knows who I am. Of course, you can you get this mindset of like, I'm famous. That's it. Uh, that's all I need <laughs> yeah. to do. Um, but I never I never thought of it that way. And I was playing clubs for, you know, almost 10 years, spinning wheels. Um, you know, this is pre pre Internet. This is pre uh, <laughs> YouTube and 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 getting and, and having those opportunities to just put your stuff out there and people see it and you get likes and you get views and I didn't have that so no. I think that kind of played to my my benefit you know because I I was used to rejection I was used to I was used to you know 15 20 people showing up at my show and I had to beg them to come you know I had to put them on the guest list <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah and now how how different things are now talking of shows of course you have as i said yeah. at the beginning just on the tour of the uk uh a, a friend of ours uh steve argyle went to see you in manchester said he had an absolutely amazing time uh really loved the gig and wanted me to just pass that on to you oh, thank um, you so much and he also said you're one of three people he's a singer songwriter he's you're one of three people he'd absolutely love to write with as well oh so. awesome, awesome. <laughs> well i gotta tell you man you know we've we've um ever since our first record you know we've been kind of playing and building and and trying to build in the UK and I remember starting at the borderline where it you know where our stage was the floor you know <laughs> and 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 we were um you know it was packed but you know it only holds but so many people and to to be able to play Royal Albert Hall was such a it was one of those moments that you don't really get the full scope of it until you start to see people's posts and pictures mm -hmm. and, and you see the organ behind you and you see the the you know the grandiose uh you know overall vibe of it and it's it's a it still feels like it was a bit of a fever dream um and it was it was so incredible uh and the fact that it was sold out um it was uh th those are those are those moments that you you never forget yeah, I, I, I've obviously never performed there, but I have been there to see concerts. It's an incredible venue. I think the yeah. intimacy, it's my favourite venue for, uh, for the closest I've ever been to the stage, I think was about 18 rows back. Mm -hmm. And yet still felt so involved with uh, the music uh, yeah. com compared to, say, an arena or, or a bigger auditorium where yeah. you can feel quite distant, even if you're in sort of the first five five rows or so absolutely how, how do the audiences differ i mean do they differ i think is the first question chris do you get a different reception here in the uk to that that you get in your native home the us uh i think i think maybe the biggest difference would be um you know we don't we're not there a lot so the anticipation and the excitement has time to build and and um so it feels like um, it, it just feels exciting and electric and you can, and you feel the energy and the, and the anticipation, uh, from, from the crowd and, and the fact that, and we've also noticed this in the States lately, and this could just be a, a symptom of, of coming back after COVID that nobody's looking through their phones anymore, mm. you know? And, and I remember for years, it was like, I would look out in the crowd and it was just like. And I'm like, I'm right here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I think there's a there's a bit of, um, you know, I think we all kind of took it for granted for a while, and 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 so everyone's just very grateful to be able to witness live music again, and um, and and I think anytime you're not in a place very often, it just it just becomes more rabid. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I totally hear what you're saying, living your life through a lens, and, and people would say, you know, well, I want to be able to remember it. It's like, well, yeah, but maybe just be in the moment, and then you've got that yeah. memory. Nobody be can present. take that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I want to talk a little bit, if we can, Chris, about sort of your influences, and you've obviously, in January this year, released Separate World, Separate Ways, Worlds Apart, mm -hmm. with uh, with Lizzie from Hailstorm. Yeah. Uh, originally by Journey, it was released 40 years ago, which makes me feel old, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> uh, that must have been an incredible experience to, for, for both of you, because I know that, that Lizzie said that, that Journey were a huge influence on her as well. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? And then how did it feel to actually put that together and record it? We, you know, Lizzie and I had been talking for years about um, working on something together and, uh, you know, the, the stars never really quite aligned. And uh, we were, me and the guys were in the dressing room on, on the last uh, U.S. tour and last fall. And we were, we were talking, we wanted to, we wanted to, we knew the, the record cycle was coming to an end and we wanted to come out with, we wanted to cover something and and that was iconic that would in a way kind of become ours as well and we had kicked around some ideas and we we certainly were aiming towards the 80s because we we just 
we love that that we wanted to find a song that had the cool synth vibe and the you know uh, it's something that we could make big and rock and and i think originally one of the songs was uh we had, we had talked about was uh final countdown and <laughs> and and you know as cool as that hook was i was like i i don't know if we're going to be able to wipe the cheese off of this one like it's <laughs> it's it's going to all i'm going to ever picture up is us doing a karate montage or something <laughs> and uh and so we kind of let it go for a minute and then fast forward to we're off tour and me and my wife are, are watching Stranger Things and it's the it was on the last season, the finale, and there was this this epic scene where everybody's, you know, it's this everybody's coming together and they're going to take out the bad guy. I don't want to spoil it for any, anybody, but if you haven't seen it, you've been living under a rock. <laughs> <laughs> and um separate ways, but the way they had it chopped up and 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 edited to the to the scene was so cinematic and and moving and I was like oh my god this is it this is this is what we need to cover and uh called my producer up and I was like dude we got to do separate ways and we got to make this like massive and and make it heavy and and he was like awesome let's let's work on it um and then he a couple weeks later he called me back and was like hey what do you think of doing this as a duet Mm. I was like, well, that's interesting. I guess lyrically it kind of caters to both perspectives. Let's, let's do it. And I was like, it's gotta be Lizzie. We, we have, I, this is it. This is the moment where we, we do something. And I called Lizzie up and I was like, Hey, I know we've been talking about doing something. I think I got the, the project. We want to do uh, separate ways and uh, I want you on it. And she was like, dude, I'm all in. That's my go-to karaoke song. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it just kind of, um, you know, I didn't realize at the time what it was going to do. And we certainly thought it was special in the moment when we were working on it. It just felt magical. And, um, you know, you can work with singers. I've worked with a lot of singers before and on other other projects. And, you know, sometimes you gel vocally and sometimes it feels like there's a bit of a disconnect. And we were in the studio going, holy shit, this just works like we we are like so in sync that like I, I didn't realize how well we would gel together and it was um you know I, I couldn't have asked for a better better collaborator and she's such a pro and I love her to death she as a as a friend but um as a as a musician and a vocalist I'm a fan like mm. she's she's just one of the best to do it and um and so I'm, I'm, I feel honored. And, and the fact that I was able to convince her to come to London and we were able to perform it for the first time uh, together since recording it um, at Royal Albert Hall, nonetheless, was just, um, man, she walked out and the place just erupted. Uh, <laughs> we, we were able to keep that secret on the down low for a minute. So, um, yeah, it, and we certainly hoped that people would love it. I didn't realize it was going to just make all the noise that it's making so we're uh we're very grateful for it yeah it sounds fantastic i must say and thank you you've you've definitely made it your tree you know you've 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 taken that sort of the, the the core song which is obviously a journey song but you've definitely and i love it when artists do that they they inject parts of themselves into that music yeah than, you know so many covers are just literally just that there's there's no sort of individuality gone into that and, and i love i mean I mean, one of the influences to do this was, um, I mean, it's such a dichotomy in style, but, you know, when when Disturbed did, you know, The Sound of Silence, it was, oh. it became theirs. It became a song that, that people want them to do and, and at, at their shows. And, it, and I was like, I want that kind of impact. I want it. So I, I felt like if we didn't, you know, it, first of all, it's so easy to be raked over the coals when you're when you're talking about covering Steve Perry anyway. So I felt like if we didn't just completely do it our way, it was going to be subject for, you know, ridicule and, and hate mail and <laughs> things like, cause <laughs> you know, journey fans are, are, are very, uh, very passionate and I, and I understand it. So I wanted to, to obviously honor the original in the best way and still make it 
very much ours. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you, you mentioned Disturbed there and, and, and David Draymond's voice. I mean, that was, I was, remember listening to that for the first time I was in the car and, and that was just a moment where I was... Oh, it gave me full body chills. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> Still does. Incredible, yeah. It is an incredible, incredible uh, version of that song. Thinking about your writing and when you're writing, Chris, how, how where do you get your influences from in in that sort of way? You know, sort of is it in everyday life? Is it in in from dreams or from TV or how how would you put together a song? And, and would the lyrics would it be melody? Would it be a bit of both? I think um, you know, uh, topically speaking, it's all the above. It can come mm. from anywhere. Um, I've written songs where I was really heavy into a series at the time and and just the the overall subject matter was was inspiring to me. Uh, and then there's times where you go through, you know, heartbreak or or loss. And certainly that plays a role into the lyrics. But as far as um, how I write in general, it's usually melody first. Melody melody comes very natural to me. Um, I hear a, a track or a, a chord progression and melodies just come. Uh, lyrics are usually the the thing that that really makes my head spin and I gotta gotta really be in the zone to to crack the code on that and it's fun when I'm with my producers and and we're kind of able to bounce ideas off of each other you know you have a song title or or a, or a, a cool catchphrase and and you you're off to the races and you start going with it um, but when you have nothing and <laughs> and all you've got is a melody and it usually, the melody usually kind of has some sort of gibberish in it that starts to sound like a word. <laughs> and then and then you go, okay, what does that mean? And then, or, or it might, you know, trigger a different word that sounds something like it. And then that kind of sparks uh, the creativity. But um, I, fi- I used to beat myself up all the time because I just I would listen to these songs and I would you know read the lyrics of these other artists and like oh they're so poignant like they just wake up and that we all are the biggest self-doubters out there like we all think our stuff sucks we all think that we have nothing good to say until we do um and I think those moments are kind of a gift from the universe you you just happen to pull it out of the ether and and it just works and then there's times where you feel like you're beating your head against the wall and you read it and it's like this is the most contrived <laughs> shit I've ever re- written uh <laughs> garbage so um I think that, but I think we have to write terrible songs to get to the great ones too yeah I was speaking to a, a songwriter over here and, and he was saying uh he probably writes you know 15 songs to every bad songs for every good song he writes and yeah uh, I, I think everybody's everybody's very very different aren't they uh, your latest album which is September 2021 dearly beloved was uh, released so uh, that's obviously uh, it, it, it's had time to sort of mature and 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 live you know and you live with it where, where do you think you're going next with your sound and with the uh, with, with the next album chris I think um, between Dearly Beloved and Separate Ways, that that I think Separate Ways was kind of like, a, oh, okay, this is this we can we can we can kind of lean more into this lane um, sonically, you know, um, bigger guitars, bigger drums, and uh, I've always been a big sucker for melody, regardless. So that's always. To me, at the forefront of the songs, it's got to be memorable, it's got to be melodic, and it has to make you feel something. And everything else is is just bonus. So um, we we noticed on this last cycle that that people wanted more rock from us, and we just want to give them that, you know? Um, and, and as a huge rock fan and long, ever since I was wanted to, you know, step in front of a microphone, you know, that's, that's where my heart is. And that's, that's where I, I want to stay. So um, I think dearly beloved was kind of 
reintroducing our fans to that that side of us and and uh it worked and and mm -hmm. it and it and i think uh there was a lot of sighs of relief when we came out with that record um and uh yeah it just felt feels like home yeah so uh have you got anything in the works at the minute have you got any oh yeah schedule? <laughs> oh yeah yeah we, we we've uh we've been we've been uh I've, I've got a few songs that are somewhat ready to record uh they're in they're in very very uh um final demo stages at this point and then i get back in the studio um in the next two weeks and we're gonna we're gonna start cranking out more wow. so we hope to have something out uh sooner than later for sure that's exciting stuff that is really yeah. exciting stuff well I, it's it's been a real joy to speak with you chris it oh, really likewise has. my friend and Thank um I, I do need to just share this with you the final yeah. countdown was the very first seven inch vinyl i ever ever purchased that's so cool um, that is so cool. Way to, way, to, way to bring that full circle. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> For our viewers on our YouTube channel, there is a figure over your left shoulder that uh, we spoke about beforehand. <laughs> and um, I, I I love the story that you, you told us. So over here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Deadpool. Yeah, it's Deadpool, which is very, very uh, different. How on earth did you come to have a Deadpool in your home studio? <laughs> It was our last tour with Nickelback in, I believe we were in Munich. It was the last show of the tour. And I'm on stage by myself playing home acoustic. And I just start to hear the, the crowds start kind of laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, the hell is going on behind me? And I turn around and the guys in Nickelback are wheeling this thing out on a on a little uh dolly and it's got like unicorn balloons and all this stuff on it and i'm still confused i'm like is is this just to make me laugh and they're like this is yours and i'm like how the fuck am i getting this home <laughs> <laughs> and so uh you know, the tour is over, and a few weeks later, this gigantic wooden crate shows up at my house <laughs> that I have to get a drill and undrill every screw. <laughs> he made me work with it, and it's and it's in nonetheless. It's all in these packing peanuts. So I've got to pull yeah. pieces out and dust off the packing peanuts. I had to climb inside this thing; it was gigantic. And uh, luckily, it's not heavy. It's it's actually very deceiving. It's just rubber. Um, but uh, probably the coolest gift I've ever gotten on tour. Yeah, ever. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm... and it's and it's been my catch-all. Like I have like my my sling bags on it. I got I got a bunch of necklaces. <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever I need to hang on it at the time. <laughs> it's just absolutely brilliant. I love the yeah. fact you've got Deadpool chill in there. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. It was fantastic talking to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, radio. Real story. Real life.